Hey everyone, it's Ted from Consumer Cellular, the guy in the orange sweater, and this is your wake-up call. If you're paying too much for wireless service, you don't have to keep having that nightmare. Consumer Cellular has the same fast, reliable coverage as the leading carriers for up to half the cost. So why keep spending more than you have to? Seriously, wake up! And call 1-888-FREEDOM or visit ConsumerCellular.com. Savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single line 1, 5, and 10 gig data plans with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plans offered by T-Mobile and Verizon January 2024. Thanks for listening to CarCast on Podcast One. Hey guys, welcome to CarCast. We're going to be, uh, oh, we're going to chat about... Uh, uh, Bear Jackson, Las Vegas. We're going to chat a little bit about uh, some Bronco talk, uh, uh, early Bronco and modern day Bronco, and some of the the big sales at Bear Jackson. Um, you know, but before we get started, a word from our friends at Meguiar's. Over the last few years, Meguiar's has launched the next generation of protective products specifically geared toward DIYers. They have their new hybrid ceramic line of products. Their spray wax, which is in the bright blue bottle, has their advanced SiO2 hybrid technology. It delivers ceramic wax protection and durability beyond traditional wax. They also have their hybrid ceramic liquid wax. It's a long-lasting ceramic wax and an easy-to-use uh, a liquid wax. You get that great ceramic protection again. And then in between the, you know, for that boosted shine, you can use their spray detailer. It's a ceramic spray detailer. It removes dust, fingerprints, bird droppings, and it uh, helps boost that shine. Easy-to-use stuff. Way to detail up your car a little bit. Their new product is the Hybrid Ceramic Wash and Wax. It's in that bright orange bottle. It's a unique two-liquid system. It washes and protects all at the same time. Really simple to use. You'll love it. Meguiar's has a hybrid ceramic solution for everyone. It's ceramic made easy. It's Meguiar's. Hello, welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the Motorator DeAndre here with Bill Goldberg. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm back. I'm good. I'm good. Doing well. Running around the house trying to find a good signal for you guys this morning. I don't know what's going on. Uh, it seems to be okay for now, so uh, uh, let's give it a try. Uh, but anyway, we were just chatting a second ago before we got started. You got the Lawman Mustang back in your possession. and uh, Tell us about it. How, how does it work? Marcus Angel, been working on it for a while. Safely tucked away in its car capsule. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Marcus has had the car for two, about two and, a, two and a half years. Man. So uh, uh, it's it was a nice reunion to, to get the thing back. Um, you know how a restoration is. Everybody's got their own definition of a restoration. Each car warrants a different kind of restoration. And ultimately, it's at the end of the day what, what you want to do with it when it's done. But, I mean, we the detail that he went to, to replicate every single thing that he could find literature wise yeah. uh, on this car from the factory after it went to car craft and when it was presented as the lawman, um, pretty unbelievable, man. I mean, the car, we started it up yesterday, you know, backed it off the trailer, put it in its home, temporary home for a little while. And, uh, I mean, I only spent about 30 minutes looking at it, but I was drooling the whole time. The, the fit and finish of this car is better, obviously, than it ever was. And uh, the, the thing is just spectacular. It's just a beautiful piece of history. What's, uh, what's interesting about a restoration like this, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys out there that are very good at – restorations of you know porsches camaros mustangs you know different mopar cars and and there's kind of a rhythm to it because you understand how a lot of those cars were made you know mustangs you know or whatever you know so-and-so cars they all had this and they all had that and they were assembled a certain way and there's certain little you know markers things and chalk marks and notes on the car but then you get into some vehicles that were modified or special made, right? Like this. So a guy like Marcus, who's done a million Mustangs before, he has the base understanding of of how a Mustang gets restored. A lot of the, the way things were done in the factory. But he's but, never done one like this. That's right. But this car was so special <laughs> that you talk about two and a half years of restoration – 
he wasn't turning wrenches for two and a half years. He spent a lot of time on the research and and of, of just digging up materials and everything he can. So, you know, so now th- this car includes probably more and better documentation than it's ever had in its life because of its history and how much work had to be put into the research of this. Like I, I a thousand think, times over. If you asked him how much time in two and a half years did you spend on the computer or traveling someplace or finding research, he'd probably say almost half. <laughs> you know I, I would say I would say you're probably right. But you know, um Ultimately, when you get to do, a, I mean, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but when you get to do a car like this, that's so special and so different, um, the learning process and the restoration along the way is, is, is enjoyable because it's not the norm, right? It's not that, oh, it's not that 67 GT500 that I always get and have to restore. It's, it's, it's about 10 steps above that. Um, and it's just different. It's a unique experience. And he learned a lot. I learned a lot and, um, met a lot of cool people along the way. Yeah. And, and be able to dig up that history on the car. I I would argue that this is even more complicated, probably by a significant margin than even restoring some of the racing cars, like the collection that's over here that Adam has, you know, those cars, yeah, we go through tons of photos and everything we can find on the history of that car uh, to replicate the way it looks and, and so many things about it. And then as you're peeling the skin off that car, you're you're trying to decipher all the things that were made unique for that car. But we do get a little leeway because it's going to be raced again and you can do a few a modern thing, some safety upgrades and belts and harnesses and a few things like that and bushings and whatnot. This isn't, those don't get restored to down to the exact bushing like this car would because that car is going to be used again. The racing cars are going to be used again and it does need to be safe. And, you know, so you're, it's more of the cosmetic restoration than it is anything else. You can take a few liberties under the skin, but for this car, for like the lawman, you really can't. Like, there's not a well, lot. Yeah, of- if we were going to want to drag it, you know, uh, the the NOS uh, slicks on the back that I paid God knows how much <laughs> yeah. for are certainly not up to snuff for you know today's today's vehicles. Yeah, you know, that's and, a good point. Condition. Right. Um, it just yeah, the, the yeah. tires alone, you, you'd swap them out. If you're going to drive the car or do some sort of exhibition, you'd kind of swap out the tires for something modern and not a thousand percent. Not ruin just based the, solely on the value of, <laughs> just, of what uh, I have into them. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got it back. It looks fantastic. Uh, and you got the book and the documentation stuff that he prepped for it. So I don't know. I guess. Um, I guess as you guys kind of put together the plan for the vehicle, let us know where you think it can be seen by the public. Uh, you know, as events looks like there's a show up. in October. Looks like there's a show in October. We're kind of gunning for so. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, once we once we sign in on it, um, I'll let you know for sure, and it'll be a, a great opportunity for people who have or haven't seen, haven't had the opportunity to see that car actually see it out in public because there are few and far between opportunities like that. Uh, yeah, that would be fantastic. And speaking of shows, uh, just a, a few you know, housekeeping items, just some news. Uh, we've been told that the Roadkill Nights show that we've done in the past is happening this year, presented by Dodge. I believe it's going to be August 14th. Uh, that's going to be happening. That's It's a little bit of an interesting time for us because August 14th is a Saturday and that is the peak of Monterey car week as well. Usually it's like the week before or something. Um, so that, that's kind of a tough one. That's not something I would be able to make. Uh, I don't know if you're even going to be able to make it out there and then I'll be there. You will I'll be there with the twin turbo. Okay. And then the following week, is August like uh, 20, 21st or whatever that Friday, Saturday. Um, I think it's the 21st is uh, is Woodward Dream Cruise, 
which is coming back uh, Saturday the 21st. Um, of course, the basically like the largest cruise ever, <laughs> you know, ever. Is, yeah. oh, it's always the Woodward Dream Cruise. It's a massive, massive gathering of... Uh, I will argue uh, this one will surpass any attendance ever. I think so, too, but that's also the same weekend of, of uh, uh, just in the WWE world, I believe that's a, a SummerSlam weekend uh, as well in Las Vegas. Uh, so there's Maybe a lot I going on. Take that back. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on in, uh, in, in August uh, for sure. Uh, so anyway, if you guys are looking to go out to a show, there's a lot going on. There's uh, Roadkill Nights. There's Woodward Dream Cruise. There's Monterey Car Week. And then all of the events, of, of course, happening at Monterey Car Week. I, I would like to see it a little bit more of a, a spread happening. Um, it's tough to say who yes. who gets to claim that weekend. Is it Monterey or is it, you know, is it Detroit? But uh, it'd be nice if they're. Oh, by the way, also I I think you know for for the Z car fans, I also think that the twentieth, somewhere around that date is ZCon, which is the big Z event, which Adam and I went to a, a year a year ago. Did car cast out there? They do debuted the four hundred Z. The ZCon this year will have the debut of the actual production, the first production car Z, not the concept, not the Z proto. But I believe it's the same weekend again as Woodward Dream Cruise. It's the weekend right <laughs> after Monterey. Uh, so there's a lot going on during that time, and there won't be any way to to fly around and go to all of these things. You get to kind of pick and choose. But at least we have many options. So if you're in Colorado or if you're in Monterey or if you're in Michigan, we've got a handful of events that you could go to. Uh, let's see. We've also got, uh, we just got back from Bear Jackson in Las Vegas, or I just got back from Bear Jackson in Las Vegas. It was, it was a good event. They, they did very well. Uh, I believe $48 million in, in total sales. Uh, they had some pretty significant cars out there, which were very cool to see. Uh, I have a little bit of a, of a recap here on a few of the cars. It uh, it was the first event that they've done at that new West Hall at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Um, it's a very cool building. Uh, the the main like lobby entrance area kind of feels like an airport terminal. It's kind of like going to the. <laughs> it kind of feels like going into the uh, to the international terminal at LAX. Uh, I. There's a bunch of meeting rooms, uh, and the main room where the auction took place was about 600,000 square feet. I think they had about 250 cars. Um, I can't say for sure what the final numbers are as far as attendance. It felt a little lower than what they thought. Uh, I just think uh, people are just starting to get out again, and it was 118 degrees outside. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, and of course, previously they were at MGM, and at MGM, there's a lot of people going through the casino, just kind of a lot of traffic to begin with, foot traffic, and it's easy to, you know, buy a ticket and pop in. Uh, but at the convention center, that's a dedicated event. You have to make an effort to go there and do that, which is. Is fine. I just think that uh, as people realize this is a cool venue and a cool event, uh, people will start to to go there more. But the attendance was good. I'm not saying it was it was bad. It was good. A hundred percent of the cars sold, obviously, because everything was no reserve. Uh, some of the big cars were the the McLaren P1 that we talked about, owned by uh, by Dead Mouse. Chris knows Dead Mouse. He's a DJ. He's a musician. He does stuff. He does music stuff. I know <laughs> of him. <laughs> <laughs> of of him, Dead Mouse. Uh, one point five million and change, almost one point six million, uh, all in with the fees for the McLaren P1, the twenty fifteen P1. 
Uh, the 2019 Ford GT, this is the newest Ford GT. Uh, we've seen these pop up a few times. Uh, $1,028,500 all in. The, the, the Mercedes uh, 300 SL Roadster. Uh, this isn't the Gullwing, obviously. It's the Roadster. $1,045,000. It's about where we thought we'd be. These are million-dollar cars. Maybe the hammer price was a little light on that. Uh, I think I think people are trying to get 1.2 for it. Um, some pretty interesting uh, uh, vehicles. A 63 Corvette split window coupe went for $396,000. I believe that was a custom, though. I don't think that was just like a number matching. Yeah, customs. That, that, that's the thing is, is we were finding – uh, the muscle cars, the all matching numbers, original muscle cars peaked for a while and then they dipped for a couple of years and now they're starting to come back. But then the customs that are well done, you know, it wasn't eight or 10 years ago where you, you know, you'd give Chip Foose $400,000 to build you something and then you'd sell that thing for 80 grand at Barrett Jackson, right? But now people are starting to recognize the the quality of the vehicle. So some of the older cars, Foose cars, Ring Brothers cars, even Boyd Coddington cars from back in the day are popping back up and getting pretty good money. And there are a ton of custom vehicles, many very well done, not all of them, but many very well done that are popping up at Barrett Jackson. And, and what you're finding is... The ones that are well done are getting recognized for the quality of the work. And they're starting. There's not just one or two builders anymore, right? Right. There's not one or two builders, but also (laughs) keep in mind that there is a business. There's a business model of, of many shops grabbing a car and going, oh, hey, let's go out and let's pick up a. Let's pick up a used Gen 1 Bronco, nothing special. See if we can get it for 30, 35, 40 grand, you know, all stock. And let's go ahead and rebuild it, turn it into a a modern day, you know, air conditioning and a decent stereo and give it the, you know, uh, refresh all the parts and stuff on it. You know, maybe get into it for about $100,000, $110,000 total. See if you can flip it for 140 150 at Barrett Jackson. There All are, it takes is that one vehicle for that company yeah. to make it to the forefront. That's and, it. And that's not a bad business model because there's a lot of people that look at those Broncos and go, I would like to get one that's already kind of done. Now, there is a difference between, you know, the 15 of those I probably saw at Barrett Jackson and the three or four that are knocking on the door of like icon Bronco quality, right? Oh, yeah. And then no question. You, you see those types of builds really start to pull in the, in the money. Uh, that's where this 63 split window coupe comes in at $396,000. Uh, uh, I don't have it here in front of me specifically, but I want to say that Ring Brothers Camaro, the 70 or 72 Camaro, uh, the green one called Grinch, $385,000 that car pulled. But when you look at that thing, you get it. Like, it's a Ring Brothers car. They're a notable builder. They did a fantastic job on the thing. It's immaculate, and you know it's going to uh, you know, work well. It better but, be all like, of the above. I want to say when, when some of the first, like, Ring Brothers Mustangs were popping up at Barrett-Jackson and getting $250,000, Mike and Jim Ring were like, that's that's insane. That's great money in the aftermarket for for that car. Now? And now they're knocking on the door four hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> well, you heard rumor about that Bron- about the Blazer a couple of years ago that I was looking at because I had a Blazer. I've got a '69 that I wanted to kind of replicate what they were doing. Yeah, somebody offered them like like a half million dollars to take it off the the floor at, at sea, and they turned it down. They turned it down, probably because they already had a client that owned that car when they built it. They're not really in the business of well, 100%. Of, of, of building cars for themselves. Well, they for, asked I, the client if he'd take that, yeah. and he said no. You know, I, I kind of agree because, you know, from a client's perspective, he's been looking at this thing for a long time and w- waiting to get into it, wait, can't wait to drive it. Uh you know, and, and I'm really the flip kind of, side of that. <laughs> you know, for the right amount of money, like 
Now, the truth is, is, is Ring Brothers had built a couple of other of those of those uh, blazers already. They had other clients going, I like what you did there. Make me one. Maybe don't make me the $500,000 one, but, but something along the lines of that. So uh, let's see. We've got a list of some of the, what, uh, top 10 uh, cars at uh, biggest selling cars. Uh, Henry Ford II, his, his personally owned at one point, 66 Ford Mustang convertible. It's an all stock, gorgeous 66 Mustang convertible. I don't know what the market is on these cars, 50, 60 grand, maybe something like that. Uh, it is a K code, which is an original GT car that adds some value to it as well. But uh, being Henry Ford II's car, it's pulled some money, $330,000 that thing went in. That uh, Frank Sinatra's 1970 Maserati Ghibli, $330,000 as well. There was a, a, a 2011 Porsche 911 Speedster. This is the modern-day Speedster with the cut windshield and stuff, $385,000. Or, uh, and of course, that uh, the Ring Brothers Grinch, three hundred eighty-five thousand dollars split window Corvette Custom, the sixty-three split window that we mentioned, three hundred and ninety-six thousand dollars. And then uh, this is an interesting one. We were speculating all over the Fast and Furious Toyota Supra. You know, the first movie now twenty years old. Uh, this is the Paul Walker car, the orange one with the crazy graphic on the side. Now, this car, I believe, also ended up in the second movie as a gold super. It was like wrapped and reused, but then when somebody got it, they restored it back to the first movie. $550,000 all in. So it's a hammer price of five hundred. dollars You add your fee, $550,000. And we're trying to figure out, is this a good buy? Is it a bad buy? Is it, you know, where does it fall? And I, I'm kind of neutral on it. I think it's, I think it's fine. I think you spend... We're kind of getting into this world where it's it's a significant movie franchise, and other than the Charger, this is the iconic car of that franchise. Uh, as the movies got bigger and kind of over the top, and they're throwing things out the back of airplanes and monster trucks and stuff, it's cool action and stuff, but you don't recognize those vehicles as anything other than a stunt vehicle, right? So what I think what the They're franchise not a co-star anymore. Yeah, that's the thing. Is that's you nailed it exactly. It it started the vehicles became more about the action and a little less about the co-star, right? The iconic image of that car. And it's Interesting because when we saw that first movie, we're like, oh, the Toyota Super is orange and it's got this wacky graphic on the side. But now it's so recognizable. Now it's worth five hundred and fifty. Now it's worth five hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Like that's that's uh that's it. You know, so now we, we start to kind of understand. Uh, you know, I, Fast and Furious Five, which is one of my favorite, I believe it was five, is the one where they went to like South America and they robbed the bank and they're tra- they're they're like dragging the the safe all over. That's a fun one, but nobody's going to care about seven flat black Dodge Chargers with a with a tubular bumper on it, right? Like, it, no one's going to. Those were stunt cars. There's no hero car in that. It was a cool scene, but. There, there's you don't not, get the same thing. Yeah, you don't get the sure. same thing out of it. So, uh, I kind of like that this car pulled this kind of money. I think it's um, it's a testament to the franchise. It's a testament to Toyota Supras, what they've been doing recently. Uh, uh, Paul Walker as well. Um, you know, it it helps when when you're a super likable guy. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> you know, and a car guy, and a, and a car guy. Uh, you, you know, I would I would argue that a lot of the Paul Walker stuff over time, even more time, will become more valuable. Absolutely. Uh, now, Paul Walker, a great driver in these movies, and I was on the track with him. Like I said, nice guy, great driver, but a little different than let's say. You know the Paul Newmans and the Steve McQueens. Oh yeah, because he doesn't. He didn't really have a lot of actual racing background. I just think he would like to have had the opportunity to do more racing, and he was a great, he was a great driver. But 
doesn't have you know doesn't have the championships doesn't have a lot of significant wins doesn't have a lot of you know that kind of stuff but uh this franchise certainly hopes uh i believe there's going to be a 10th movie by the way it was gonna be a 10th movie before they wrap it up they're gonna go to space i think they're gonna go to space (laughs) you gotta go to space in a tesla Uh, yeah (laughs) right um anyway so uh uh Rounding out the list is a 65 AC Cobra, 289 Roadster. Uh, this is CSX 2439. Very cool car. I do, as much as we love the 427 Roadsters, um, the slab side, you know, 289s are also pretty cool. $907,500. Our friend Aaron Shelby brought it up on stage. Uh, and then the top three of car, you know, were the four GT we talked about, the SL Roadster, and the McLaren P1 at one million five hundred sixty-seven thousand five hundred. Uh, so it was a good event. It was fun to see those cars. Like we said, six hundred thousand square feet at this event, and it's the first time in the Las Vegas Convention Center. Although they've been in Vegas for a few years, but coming up in September is the first ever Barrett Jackson Houston first Texas event. They. It's at the NRG Center, and I believe the room is a little larger. It's about 700,000 square feet. It should be a cool event. Uh, I know uh, you're going to be trying to get your motorcycle at that event. We'll be out there as well. Uh, hey, before we segue up to the Houston event, we, yeah. we have to talk about like literally the coolest event that went on during Barrett Jackson, and I'm very pissed, obviously, that I wasn't there for it. <laughs> there you go. You got the Bravago. shirt. He's got the Bravago shirt right? on. Uh, tell us how it went, man. It, it, Come on, tell it us went. How, I'm, I'm, I, you're not plugging. I, I'm, I, I'm putting you up to it. I got it. I got it. Um, it went. It went very well. Uh, we weren't quite sure what to expect, and I just can't say thanks enough to. Uh, everyone that came out to the event and supported us, we, you know, we sponsored the the Skybox and the Bitter Bar, and then there was a a I want to say cash bar, but nobody takes cash anymore. It's all so I don't even know what you call it. It's just called the the, the cash bar. Uh, the signage looked great. The attendance was great. People seemed to really really like the drink. It's you know our formulation, especially with the monk fruit, you know adds a little bit of sweetness to it, but not sugar to it. So the sweetness that you're tasting isn't adding a bunch of sugar to the drink. It's still a very very good drink. And I'll tell you, uh, people went up and they bought the first flavor, whichever one they wanted. Seemed to really like it. Went back and bought a second and a third flavor. And at an event like this. It's that repeat business that is such a testament to the quality of the drink. So I really do appreciate that. I thought we would move something like 35 or 40 cases. I was really unclear. Even Barrett Jackson's estimates that they gave us uh, fell into that range. Um, we ended up moving 47 cases, uh, which is which is fantastic and includes some of the donated stuff. But you know, uh, forty-seven cases comes out to be, I don't know, over eleven hundred uh, cans. Um, That's so, so good. very, very happy about that, and I'm glad that we used this event as our first event. Um, I, I think, you know, Houston would be a little more difficult just because of the distance for us. Uh, and Arizona doable, but such a big event, you know, three four times the size of of uh, of Vegas that it it would have been a little bit overwhelming. So I say that uh, this was a great event for us. We're looking forward to doing more events, and then then to answer a lot of questions is where do you get the product? How are you going to get the product? This was a test run for us. We. We specially made product just for this event because this this pandemic has screwed up so many things for so many in- industries. We talked about computer chip issues for all the cars that are being built. Uh, that has trickled down to the beverage industry as well. Aluminum cans are impossible to get. 
the machines that make the product and can the product, the chips for those you can't get, like the car industry, uh, the the cost of steel to to even grow your business. If a if a one of your manufacturers is has got the big giant vats that where they're brewing all this stuff, for them to expand, there's a six month wait on getting new machines. Uh, so it's kind of a pain in the ass, but it's not really any different than any other, you know, industry that's going on, you know, uh, uh, sort of in the manufacturing. So this is what we're doing. We're working with a group right now to we're, – we're, we're working on it's, – it's not really building out the website. The website is easy to build. It's all of the licensing and stuff involved on on – building a virtual retail network to be able to sell alcohol online oh. and and ship it to you at home right it's called DTC direct to consumer so uh anyway we're building that out we've worked with a company that's to, that's you know put together a bunch of licensing we should have a website up it Probably about two months, and it's not about getting the website up. It's about getting product to fulfill those product. orders yeah. uh, and uh, and getting it in cans and labels. But uh, the best I can figure right now is we will be able to sell it online and ship it to you in 29 states, which is more than I thought we were going to be able to get. Uh, 29 states. Certainly, the big states are included. I don't have the full list, but California, Texas, Florida, Jersey, Wisconsin, Illinois, like those are all on the list. Um, Some of the ones you would expect, uh, Utah, I don't think can make the list. (laughs) Different rules. Uh, So I would say this, like, uh, Just follow us on social media. We would appreciate that. We're at Drink Bravago across all the social media platforms. If you go to the website now, drinkbravago.com, you can sign up. At least just if you sign up, you're just giving us your email and your zip code. That helps us where to target our sales efforts. And And we can let you know as soon as possible when it's available in your area. Well, we'll get you on that insider list. You know, shipping direct to consumer is a pain in the ass because – the shipping is expensive. We'll try to offset some of that for you, but there's all these rules. We gotta, you know, we get charged for for shipping alcohol. We get charged for a 21 and over signature, and then we get charged for all kinds of crap. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. I'll tell you this: for us as a business, there's no money to be made in shipping it online. Once we start to subsidize even some of the shipping costs, there's really no money. What I'm trying to do is come up with a solution where we can get product to you guys uh, that want it, even if it's not hugely profitable. And then as we develop our retail network and get into the various states and stores, then, yeah, then there is a, a viable business model there. So anyway, thanks for everybody who came out to that. We're hoping to have – uh uh, Bravago at Barrett Jackson Houston and hopefully some other events as well. And I'll keep you updated. And again, if you if you sign up on the newsletter or the social media, we'll we'll keep you posted on all of that stuff. Uh, okay. So also on the the list of things to hit before we run out of time, I you know that show rides our friend Bud Brutzman did that series long ago, sort of a docu series. It was it was a lot of fun. He did like the Hot Wheels car, Deanda or something like that. I forgot which one it was. He did a couple of cars, and one of the episodes I liked was they brought back that Ford Cobra, but they did like that 2004 concept car, right? Kind of a modern looking. It was called Daisy, uh, and yeah. Ford Ford's intention was to actually make this before the Ford GT. This was going to be their supercar. I mean, it's the size of a Miata, modern day Cobra. They got Cheryl, Carol Shelby involved. He was in the the docu series. Uh, just a very cool car. But they only ended up making one of these things, and it had a six point four liter V ten engine, naturally aspirated. Yes. With 605 horsepower, again the size of a Miata, 605 horsepower. Six-speed manual transaxle, which was part of the Ford GT program that ended up into this car. 
Uh, very cool piece. I always kind of like this thing. I thought it was kind of unique, uh, special to the to the Shelby brand. Well, this car is coming up for auction. It's going to be at Monterey uh, Meekum wow. auction. Uh, I don't know what the value is of this car. I, uh, I mean, if this thing did three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, I'd say, yeah, that. That seems cool. Maybe it seems a little light. If it was a million dollars, I would say I, that doesn't surprise me either. I mean, I I don't see why it's it, all it, what somebody's going to pay for it. Yeah, you know, there's no logic to it whatsoever. You can you can apply certain logic that carries through, but I mean, at the end of the day, that's two. Um, <laughs> it's it's worth what somebody's going to pay for. Yeah, you know, you, and like you said, it, it takes two people in the room to 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 get it to where it needs to go. But the other thing that I like about this is this is a fully registered street legal car. This isn't a, a prototype that a that got pushed around to auto shows that you could never really, you know, like it's got a I VIN drive. number. Yeah, it's got whatever. It's got a registration and stuff. You can you can drive this thing if you wanted to. I don't know how many miles are on the car, or or once it gets listed, you know, on on the auction block. I'm I'm sure we'll know for sure the rest of the the specs and stuff on it. But uh, you know, but a well documented car certainly that show rides helps. You get you get a you basically get a 44 minute special about the the build oh, of yeah. this car. Uh, I believe it ended up in uh, uh, the movie. Triple X State of the Union with Ice Cube. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe not the movie I'd be bragging about. <laughs> uh, but but the car looked good in the film. Maybe not the best film ever ever, but uh, but it certainly ended up. So you know, it's got a little bit of movie history. It's got some TV history. It's got a lot of uh, uh, you know automotive history. It was the one coolest of coolest factor. It's cool. It's cool, and Carol Shelby drove it, and he's in the TV show, and obviously signed it for real, and you know, and getting that all star team with Jay Mays and stuff back in the day with at Ford, it, it's a it's a cool car. So I'd be curious to see where this thing goes. It doesn't surprise me if this thing hits eight hundred thousand to a million bucks. Uh, it's just it's a cool piece. Just wish I made more money. I got to make more money. Uh, a lot more money. Uh, Audi RS3. Audi RS3, uh, there's a, a, you know, new version, a little update to that. I, I kind of liked the RS3. It's the smaller one, but it's, it's, it's the hot little sedan. Uh, a cool looking little car. It's a cool looking, but it was fun to drive. You know, like it was just when I drove the previous version, you know, just kind of like zipping around town, especially in a very condensed populated town like LA having kind of that small but little sports car like easy to park fits in compact spots is a blast to drive uh, it was all wheel drive as well uh th- the new version of this thing um they're 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 trying to spice it up a little bit more uh that uh, I think is is kind of cool I'm looking at some of the specs but for some stupid reason these Pop up ads keep covering all my, <laughs> keep covering all the. I don't see this stupid thing to get off there, but uh, it's got a little bit more horsepower. It's got a little bit more torque. It's you know it's whatever six more horsepower and a handful uh, more pound feet of torque. Uh, the zero to sixty two. That's about all they've they've done at this point was. Is about three point eight seconds. You'll be able to get a dynamic package with it with carbon ceramic brakes. They say one hundred and eighty mile an hour top speed. Uh, it is all wheel drive, but there's a, a new differential that they're putting into it that actually applies some torque vectoring, and it'll power. It'll put a hundred percent of its of its power to one of the rear wheels, which means uh, you can expect a drift mode to be available mm-hmm. in this car. So if you want to have a little fun with it in that respect, but still being all wheel drive, it does have that drift mode. I always thought there were a lot of bang for the buck. I think it's, it's going to be uh, uh it's going to be kind of cool. It sits a little lower, eh, almost a half an inch, not quite maybe 0. 0.4. 
inches lower than the than the standard S3. I like that I'll have a carbon ceramic break option. I'm sure it'd be kind of an expensive option, but uh, anyway, it's just kind of a cool little cool cool little hot car worth mentioning since uh, there's a you know some some exciting things coming down uh, coming down the pipeline as we. Uh, for really small guys. <clears throat> yeah, and that's the other thing. It's it's uh it's kind of it's kind of itty bitty. It's 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 a little small. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It's a little small. It's funny because before uh before I think it was like a week or so before Bear Jackson, you and I talked, I was like, Oh, you know, I'm thinking about that Gen One Bronco. I'm gonna have a tough time finding one that's affordable enough to rebuild. Uh there's one up on Bring a Trailer right now that's a little rough. Um, maybe more than a little rough. I know everyone's like, it's great. It's got all this patina. It's like, yeah, it's it's got rusty floorboards and the air conditioning doesn't, you know, it it's it's rough. Uh, so we get, we'll see where that goes. And you had stated that the Gen 1 Broncos, although very cool, are a little small. A little small for you, uh, yeah, for sure. Perfect for you. But uh, I saw a bunch of those at Barrett-Jackson. Again, there must have been... 15, 20, maybe 25 of those things there. There was probably four or five in the row just in the salon collection. Uh, but Ford Performance came out to the event. It's one of the manufacturers. Lexus was there. Dodge was there. And they brought the Bronco. They brought the new Bronco. They had the the new full-size Bronco four-door, and it was kind of tricked out, and it was a charity car. But they brought out that Badlands, the the two door. Uh, I texted you the photos, like Broncos here. There's the blue one, beautiful blue with the flares yeah. and stuff on it. Gage yeah, really liked it. It's a uh, it is it is a good size. It is bigger than you would think. It's not you know you know seventy two Bronco or sixty seven Bronco. It is definitely bigger than that. And if you go and you look at Broncos Sport on the showroom floors now or even start to see them popping up on the streets, it is bigger than that. And especially when you add, you know, when you get like a Badlands version, it's got the big tires and stuff. It It is pretty cool. Now, there's a couple of press events that are happening now. People are starting to drive them. So we're going to get just a windfall of information and photos and videos across all the automotive platforms very soon. Uh, I wasn't able to make that event. We did Barrett Jackson, and of course the Bravago launch and stuff. If there's going to be another one, hopefully I can I can get into that. Uh, but it is it is pretty it is pretty cool to to see that. I am curious to see what the hot version, right? The Warthog, sort of the Bronco uh, Raptor, Wild Track. Well, Wild Track is one of the trim levels, oh. but but. Uh, uh, War- yeah, but it. Warthog is going to be what they're going to call the Raptor version. So if you want a Bronco Raptor, it's going to be a Bronco yeah. Warthog. That's going to be cool. I think that's out in maybe next year. I think next summer when Bronco R comes out, the V8 version, I think the Bronco – I'm sorry, when Raptor R comes out next summer with the V8, yeah. I, I believe Bronco Warthog will come out. Uh, and our best guess on that, whereas Raptor R will have the Shelby GT500 supercharged engine, 760 horsepower in the GT500. I kind of feel like it's going to be like 750. Um, I don't know if it's going to be this, the full 760. It'd be cool if it will. But, you know, there are always there's always things like, oh, we had to reroute the exhaust and had to do a little bit of tune to, you know, to to get that power band, you know, a little bit lower into the more usable for a truck, you know, so if it's... And the sports car has got to be faster than the truck. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. Is, is, yeah, you kind of want the GT500 to, to, you know, to to be a, a little better on the horsepower range. So, you know, if, yes. if the Raptor R was 750 horsepower with gobs of torque, that would be fantastic. And the... Uh, the engines, like the EcoBoost engines that are that are in uh, in the Bronco, I believe the Bronco Warthog would have the 400 horsepower version, the 3.5 liter twin turbo, 400 horsepower version that's in the Ford Explorer ST. 
right? Which is the hotter version of that. So that's 400 horsepower. I'd expect that. Now, unlike the Raptor and the GT500, it would make sense for the Bronco to be that 410, 420. You know, it should be a little better than the Explorer, right? If the Explorer is 400, the the Bronco should be, you know, 425 is what I think. They'll find a place. Yeah, they'll find it. Yeah. And then, of course, in the middle of the, of the road between all this is the Raptor facelift for, for coming out this year, but the same EcoBoost engine, 450 horsepower. So you can get Bronco at 400-ish, Bronco Warthog, Raptor EcoBoost, and then Raptor R next year, you know, 400, 450, and arguably 750, 760 horsepower. So anyway, pretty pretty cool stuff. Uh I guess we'll get uh, into that a little bit more. I haven't heard from Ford. They said they're making my Mach 1 this week. Could have happened today. Could have happened yesterday. I certainly didn't get the email going, hey, good news. We did. we made your car. So uh, not so uh, sure uh, if that's happening, but <laughs> I don't, we're going to wrap we'll things up. Fun. We're going to let you go. I know uh, we, we're running out of time, but... I uh, I went to an event and I met with some our friends in the aftermarket and they said, "Oh, we're developing all these cool parts for the Mach One, and uh, you know, are you getting one?" And I said, "Yeah." And they said, "Well, what trim? What color? Whatever." And I told them, and they said, "That's exactly what we want." I go, "Oh, uh, okay." And they said, "Well, are you going to drive it all the time?" I was like, "Well, yeah. I I wanted to change the engine in the Lightning." <laughs> And I want to change the engine and the lightning so I can drive, you know, and I can drive the Mustang in the meantime. And they said, well, how do you feel about it not driving it? And we put it in the SEMA booth and we do some work on it. And I was like, eh, okay. And so I'm excited about it. Being, I'm excited about it being a SEMA car, but it's a lot like you just got the lawman delivered and you can't really do anything with it except look at it in a big bubble until it does its – you know, debut at yeah, whatever and the, show. And the, and, TRX, and the TRX was away from the house for the first two months of its life. I yeah. didn't even get to touch it because this guy wanted it, this company wanted it. But it's, the, it's you know, it's, it's a... It's a trade-off. I, I right? would, I would so, be excited. I'd be honored for the car to show up at SEMA. Uh, I think it would be fantastic. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I did have a nice conversation with our friend John Urist from Hillion turbo as i was driving out nice. to vegas i had many hours in the car and uh i was i was driving out with tammy and i go i just got to make a phone call real quick he picked up the phone we talked for probably 40 minutes uh, about everything that he's going on with his turbo development for uh, a bunch of vehicles he's really making a push working with sema on emissions legal 50 state emissions legal turbo packages for nice. late model muscle cars and trucks. So expect to see that. I think his first turbo package is going to be the Ford F-150. Uh, we saw the F-150 turbo kit at SEMA, I guess, two years ago, uh, whatever the last SEMA was. In the Ford booth, he had a stealth turbo packages for the F-150. It, nice. it, it goes in between the exhaust manifold and the catalytic converter, stock catalytic converter, and stock exhaust all the way back, unchanged. He just puts a turbo in between, and they sat low, and he didn't change any of very few changes to the induction system, right? It almost looks like a stock air box, but it does have an intercooler, and the piping kind of goes through it. So fantastic stealth system, but he's been working with SEMA on getting it emissions Legal, and that's huge, and that's expensive. Yes. <laughs> We're going <laughs> you know, through that so, right now with Goldberg's garage. That's right. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate what he's doing with that and uh, and you guys as well with Goldberg's Garage packages. But uh, all right, so let's go ahead and wrap things up. I know you've got some errands to run, and we've got another show coming in. But, guys, thank you so much uh, for listening. Uh, I want to tell you guys about uh, our friends over at Empire Covers. You know, nowadays, cars are designed to keep you safe on the road, but are— you providing the same protection for your car off the road. Empire Covers offers high-quality, affordable covers engineered to protect against rain, UV rays, tree sap, pollen, anything that damages the vehicle paint. 
And for premium protection, try the American Armor covers. They're proudly made in the Kentucky factory, and they have covers for RVs, boats, motorcycles, and more. And all the covers come with a free multi-year warranty. And our deal right now is you get free shipping plus 15% off the entire cover uh, your entire order with promo code CARCAST. So go to empirecovers.com slash CARCAST. Use promo code CARCAST. It's Empire Covers. Protect what you love. Of course, you can find us at uh, CARCAST Show on the website. Bill, thank you so much. I'll let you go, and I'll wrap things up. You can follow uh, Bill Goldberg at Goldberg95 and Goldberg's Garage on Instagram. And you can follow me at Motorator uh, and, of course, Drink Bravago at Drink Bravago Everywhere. And our friends at Geico. Uh, You own your home or you rent your home, and we know how much work that can be. Well, you know, it's easy. It's bundling your policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And that's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home already. So just go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening. Until next time, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit carcastshow.com. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> That's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil.